The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests today are Lisa Crone and artist John Outerbridge. Author-performer Lisa Crone has been writing and performing solo work for the past 14 years. She received an Obie, an LA Drama Log, and was nominated for Drama Desk, Outer Critics Circle, and New York Press Award. And those were all just for 2.5 mile ride. Right. <laughs> uh, and that play has played continuously uh, in every and any venue Lisa can find, <laughs> right? <That's> right. <laughs> You're from Michigan. Were you acting there? Uh, well, I'm originally from Michigan. I went to college there. But um, uh, right out of college, I toured with a national repertory company. Um, and then I went home to Michigan for uh, nine months to make some money, and then I moved to New York. So I've been in New York for about 15 years. But uh, did, were you going to always be an actress? No. Oh, what were you doing in Michigan when you went out on tour? Well, uh, that was out of college. I mean, I, I, um, I mean, I think now... I felt for many years like I was really meandering through my career. And then at some point I realized I had gone on a very straight line. But the final sort of destination was uh, lesbian solo performance artist, and that wasn't something that I knew existed. <laughs> oh, so I, <laughs> you mean that's really, uh, that's where you are now? Right, I mean, among other things. I mean, I also act in other people's plays, and I'm in a theater company. Um, but, um, you know, the idea of creating my own work um, and it just wasn't like that. You weren't just going to be an actress. Were you going to be a writer? No, I don't know if I... Th I, I think Were I, you going to be a teacher? I, you know what I wanted to be? I wanted to be a mother and a homemaker. Oh, did that? Oh, so I did. That was very 70s. <laughs> yeah, I you know. I don't know. I, I was really, you know, I, was, I used to play um, house with my brother. Uh -huh. Well, he wanted to play... I wanted to play house by myself. <laughs> so and you he could would control say, everything. He, would, he kept... I kept... He wanted to play that he was the father, and I'd say, all right, there's a war on. You have to go to war. I kept, <laughs> I kept jettisoning, him, jettisoning, <laughs> jettisoning him out of the picture. Get out of here. Right. <laughs> so did you play 2.5 mile ride in Michigan? No, I haven't. Did, does it have anything to do with it? I mean, you were there, you, you left your... Uh, tell us the story. I don't want to tell the story. Well, I the, mean, you can tell it better than I can. The play uh, mixes three different stories. It juxtaposes three different stories. One is about a trip that I took with my father to his hometown in Germany. Um, and the uh, and then we went on to Auschwitz, where his parents were uh, sent, and from which they never returned. My father left Germany by himself in 1937. Um, the second story is about my extended Midwestern family's annual trip to the Cedar Point Amusement Park in Sandusky, Ohio, where my father loves to ride the roller coasters. And the third is about my brother's engagement and subsequent wedding to a woman he met on the Internet. So that, I guess I was taking the Midwestern part of it and thinking that that was the main part of it, but it really isn't. It, it just is named after the main part of it, actually. Yeah, I although mean, I think the name also relates Ohio's. a little bit, well, symbolically relates to somehow to, um, you know, the metaphor roller coaster kind of runs throughout the piece, the idea of Go up and down and my father's approach to his own life. And so uh, let's start. Were you writing three separate plays? Oh, and no. Did you put them all together? No, uh, I always write uh, short uh, in short anecdotal pieces, I think because for some reason I don't have a longer attention span than that. <laughs> and I do that relatively easily and quickly, but then I spend a very long time taking those pieces and trying to put them together. And with this particular play, I just started to, uh, you know, when I started to write, I wrote about the two experiences that were newest and most on my mind, which were at that point the trip to Europe and the trip to the amusement park. Um, those were the two newest. At that point, At that yeah, my point. brother hadn't even, the story about my brother hadn't even oh, begun to happen yet. I so um, I had these, you know, pages of writing, and right before I went out to read it for the first time, I 
thought, well, what happened if I shuffled these pages? And it became clear there was some kind of a dynamic energy from oh. juxtaposing these two very different. I mean, I, at the when I started, I had no idea if this would be a piece. What it was just, I need to do some new writing. What's going to come out? Oh, is that right? Well, then, does somebody come in and help you direct it, or did you put the pieces together yourself? Um, well, I. Uh, worked on it on my own for a while until I had about 25 minutes worth of material and I was doing various readings of it different places but uh, I did work with over its life and it took about five years to develop I mean I was doing other things as well but from the first writing to when it was set was about five years um, I worked with uh, three different directors during that time. And the first one, Lowry Marshall, who teaches at Brown University in the acting program, she worked very intensively with me as a dramaturg. And she, because it's a, you know, it's a piece that's made up of all these really separate pieces and how to weave that. That's it's a very woven <coughs> piece. And, uh, well, one word touches off the next situation. Right, right. And uh, <coughs> it's very much, you, I think as you watch it, you can't, you don't have any idea how it's going to come together in the end, and it's not like it, there's anything, it's complete, but it's not neat. I, I think maybe that's a good way to explain it, because sometimes you wonder, why is she going to this, why is she talking about that? Is, is that part of what she was just talking about? But then once you start talking, it, com it becomes clear. So that little episode becomes clear. Right. But it's hard to get them all together. And I think that keeps your audience on the edge of their chairs or keeps them questioning. Right, right. Well, I, I <coughs> like, I mean, the, the, sort of the writers I most admire are ones who don't use a lot of adjectives, you know, who just say, I mean, I'm overstating that, but who just say this happened, then this happened. Then Robert Graves, for instance, is one of my favorite authors. And he doesn't tell you how to think. He lays out a situation and you have a response to it. And that's a very interesting dynamic to me and I want to do that in this piece. I want to lay out certain things so that you respond to the piece. I mean of course it's very carefully orchestrated what I'm doing but I'd like the response to be like life in that I'm not going to tell you how to respond. I'm going to lay out some very potent things and you are going to have a response to it and to a certain degree you have to decide what your response is going to be. This is a good time to bring it up I guess. How do the audiences respond? Are they always different or can you tell how they're responding while you're on stage? Well they, they are very different <coughs> um, because the piece of course deals with the Holocaust then it deals with my family in the Midwest, um, and uh, so it moves back and forth very quickly between being very funny and being not funny at all. Um, and initially you think that when you're in the Midwest it's going to be funny, and when you're at the uh, concentration camp <coughs> it's not going to be funny. And then those things start to merge a little bit. And thematically or aesthetically I was very interested in the way comedy and tragedy are the flip sides of each other. I mean artistically I'm interested in the way everything contains its opposite. And so the audience, sometimes they laugh very, very hard, and sometimes, and they're really fluid and willing to go back and forth from really laughing to mm -hmm. really being quiet, and there are some very quiet moments in the show. And sometimes uh, they have a harder time going back and Can forth. Can you feel it? Does the audience drive you in any way? Does it pull you back, or does <laughs> it push you ahead? Well, it's very helpful <laughs> to me when the audience <laughs> responds audibly. Um, it it's does. It's built that way. The show is built that way in a certain way because I speak directly to the audience and uh, the conceit of it is that I'm saying, telling you a story that I'm telling you sitting right here in this chair for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, so the more audible response I get, uh, the, it, it gives me something. I mean, that's always the theatrical dynamic. But they don't answer you by words. Have they ever done that? Sometimes. Do they? And well, how you know, do you play with that? Well. <laughs> I'll tell you when it's happened. You know, I have the device of showing the slides, but there I are no... I want to talk about that. Right. So, um, let, tell us about it if you're going to talk about an audience reaction, because that's one of the most brilliant things that I've ever seen on stage. Oh, brilliant. Um, I, sh I start by showing a series of slides of my family, but there are no pictures. There are just squares of colored light. But I describe them as if they're really pictures and you there. you just go click. And I click, and there's a sound, and then the, the square changes. And, um, you know, I say, of course, you can see here that now we're looking at whatever. And uh, when I was in uh, performing it in London, actually, at the Barbican, a man on the second slide said, excuse me, madam, <laughs> but there's, we can't, there are no slides there. We can't see anything. 
And I, you know, for a moment I was totally, I just... Yeah, what did you do? I had a horrible <laughs> moment. You know, basically this person was saying, your show makes no sense. But I said, um, well, why don't you just stick with me for one second? And the audience burst out laughing because the rest of them understood what happened. And then I went to the next slide and I said, so as you can see here, well, and some of you, you anyway. Oh, some of you anyway, you just <laughs> ad-lib that? Right. Did it break you? Or, no. Or did you just keep going? You I just, just kept knew. going. No, it was... It worked out well. It worked yeah. out well. It, because actually, it, is it was a, good. I mean, it is a, a very, in a certain way, a self-conscious theatrical device. And, you know, it works best when the audience is very delighted by it. And, of course, it, it resonates throughout the piece in a lot of different ways, you know. Do, does your family still speak to you? <laughs> they do. <laughs> well, I'm pretty nice to them, you have to say. For the most part, I'm pretty nice You're to them. You're pretty good. Yeah, well, <laughs> do they, are they happy then? <laughs> yeah, they're, I mean, they're very... They come to, my parents have seen it many, many times, and they, my, you know, when it's, I talk a lot about my father's, you know, he's legally blind, he has this bag of glasses, and when they come to see the show, <laughs> he's very, you know, he puts them away so everybody can see, he's putting them away so they get recognized, and sometimes I'll come out after the show and they'll be s sitting in the house with two or three other people, and they say, well, um, this is, you know, Janine and her partner, Patty, and we're going out for dinner with them right now, and I say, okay, we're going out <laughs> whatever. to dinner with Janine and Patty, that's fine, whatever. <laughs> You've written other one-person plays. Right. What, tell us a little bit about those. Um, well, I've been working on, I've been working as a solo performer for about 14 years. I've done about, I don't know, five but solo all shows. But all what you've written? Uh, all yes. All things that you've written? Yeah, although in the beginning, the last two I really wrote, and the last two are the only ones I say are good. Uh -huh. <laughs> the other ones had, they were fine, but they... Uh, they were funny, and they were developed through improvisation, and I used to sing um. in them and do a lot of different things, but I really wanted to do theater. I wanted to do, uh, which means that it has a through line, that it has a resonance, that it has some kind of dramatic action, which is the toughest thing to get in a solo show because there's no catalyst. You right. have to invent. You're the, you're the person, right? And right, where, I mean, in, you know, dramatic action means you intend to do this, and then something, there's uh, an <laughs> obstacle and something else happens, but what's the obstacle? If you're the only one on stage, you can <laughs> do whatever you want. <laughs> So, uh, my last one was called 101 Humiliating Stories. Oh, I bet that was fabulous. Uh, I loved doing that show, actually. I did it for uh, about three or four Will years. Will you bring those back again? I'd love Could to do that one that again. again? Oh, I'd love to. Uh, I'd Humiliating love to Stories, like your... Well, you know, they were interesting. Your skirt getting caught in your exactly. house. <laughs> are, are you saying that because you know that was in my I show? I know that was <laughs> Is that right? Yes, that's what other right. kind of horrible things were there? Well, you know, I was interested in the idea of uh, humiliation as a motivating force in life. And so the humiliations, for the most part, weren't some kind of elaborate stories. They were Just very sort of, you know, the idea that all of us kind of go through life and try our best to gather as much grace and humor <laughs> and agility as we can and no matter who we are there's just going to be that moment where you realize you've where had the, the core exactly is your teeth. exactly and that and that you know how do you not try to how do you not shrink back in life but continue to move forward and humiliation as the initial director of the piece and the man who dramaturged it Jamie Leo pointed out to me is related to the word humility ah uh, very good so but but do you tell the little story about it and then tell what happened and how that that happened to you or is that humiliating? Thing, well, often the whole what story? would happen is uh, I would. St I mean, the the sort of uh, dramatic device in that is that during the course of the show, I got a, I, the phone would ring on uh -huh. stage and I'd get a call asking me to come back and speak for my high school reunion. I see. And then um, so as I'm trying to tell the audience these humiliating stories, I continue to be humiliated. I see. I saw The Greatest Story Ever Told. Oh, yes. And you were in it. Yeah. So, uh, Paul Rudnick. Right. And I also saw Mineola Twins. Uh, I saw it with Susie, Susie Kurtz. Kurtz right. um, how does it feel to be using other people's words? Like a big relief. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> so great. It feels like a great vacation to just. Also, those two playwrights, Paul Rudnick and Paula Vogel, are brilliant playwrights. Very, yes. And wonderful people. And um, so. It was fantastic just to be able to concentrate on one thing and also through my work with my company, The Five Lesbian Brothers, and also in my solo work, I felt like I had developed um, certain, I had grown as an actor and it was great to be able to see how that worked in that more traditional so that could, um, Yeah, that's setting. what I was wondering. Wh which do you prefer, doing solo shows or being in uh, a big hit Broadway show? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if I... <coughs> prefer one over the I love I love in my career that I've really mixed a lot of different ways of being on stage. 
I just actually finished a tour with uh, the Susan Marshall Modern Dance Company. I know. And that, that was the Joyce fantastic Theater? too. It was at the Joyce and it was here at the Alex Theater. Oh, it was. And um, Will you do that? Will they continue doing that? It'll probably tour a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. And you dance or you speak? Well, <laughs> you call it dance? I spoke and I move around awkwardly while the dancers dance. <laughs> well, you have a much larger presence on stage than you do in person. So that must be your psyche taking over. And making Maybe. yourself big. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you were very big with us today. Thanks oh, a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa Crone, for being with us. And don't go away because on the set you see John Outerbridge's um, constructions, and he'll be back to talk to us about them uh, after the break. <laughs> Hi, welcome back. I'm Joan Quinn, and we're with artist John Outerbridge, who was born in Greenville, North Carolina, and went to the Academy of Art in Chicago. John has shown his work across the country and has been in museum shows all over. Uh, John was, I'll say, mm -hmm. the protector of the Watts Towers oh, for, for a long time. For a long time. Tell us uh, about that before we go into your career. Well, I mean, your other career. Well, <laughs> I really um, uh, could tell many stories about the Watchtowers, but the city of Los Angeles was donated that property in 19, uh, the latter part of 1975 by a, a group of concerned citizens who formed years ago to fight for <coughs> the protection of that work. Mm -hmm. The city at one point thought that it should come down because they didn't want to be liable for something that they simply did not under, understand. Uh, the creator of the Watchtowers, of course, was Simon Rudia, who started on that work in 1921 and walked away from his property, walked away from his dream and uh, the Watchtowers in 1954. And uh, when he left, uh, the work uh, was just left standing alone for a period of, of time. Did you, and, uh, had you seen it? In I had, your lifetime? I, I, had, I had heard faintly of the Watts Towers. Oh, but you uh, weren't someone who went and sat there and looked at it like be, a lot of I, other Because I wasn't from Los Angeles. Oh, I came to Los Angeles in 1963. Oh, right at that. From, from Chicago. Oh, I see. And, uh, but the next year, in 1964, accidentally, I was driving about the city of Los Angeles, and uh, one Sunday afternoon, my wife and I were out for a Sunday afternoon ride, getting familiar with Los Angeles, and I made a wrong <laughs> turn, which was a good turn for me. Yeah. Uh, I turned off of Alameda Street into uh, 103rd Street, and for some reason, I saw this shimmering, growing thing coming from behind the trees. Isn't that and, exciting? Uh, yeah. It was and, an exciting and, thing. Right. So I ended up finding my way to whatever that was. And that was my first time in 1964, one Sunday afternoon, seeing the Watchtowers. Mm. But as I was saying before, uh, the city of Los Angeles was donated that property um, in the <coughs> latter part of 1975. Uh, the then Municipal Arts Department mm -hmm that eventually became the Cultural Culture. Affairs Department. That Al Nodell is running? Uh -huh. Al Nodell is now the uh -huh. uh, general manager. Uh -huh. When I was hired, uh, Kenneth Ross, oh, yes. the old fantastic personality Terrific. and general manager for 35 years of the Municipal Arts Department. I worked under him when I first started. So did and you go uh, right to work for the uh, towers? Did you just go right over there in 1975? No, uh, 1975, I think uh, there was an <laughs> examination process. Oh, there was. Uh, you had to go it, through it, all the yes, municipal... Yes, it was it, it, a civil service position. Is that right? Yeah, and uh, with, with an awesome responsibility attached uh, to it. But at the time, I had just come from uh, great experience and... Uh, a lot of work at the Communicative Arts Academy in Compton, which I was one of the founders of. Oh, uh, I didn't know about that. Yeah, very exciting, pioneering community cultural Communicative center. Communicative Arts in what respect? The Communicative Arts Paint? Academy. Well, 
or any idiom that we found accessible was part of our rationale. Mm -hmm. uh, we thought that art had the the power and the audacity to be anything that we needed of it as artists. Mm -hmm. And during the 60s and the 70s, uh, uh, minority artists, we, we had uh, no, no kind of facility this is and accommodation. So uh, during that time, I was an activist artist. And by disposition, I'm still that today, you know. <laughs> well, that <laughs> was one of the questions be. I wanted to <laughs> ask you is, is, is mm -hmm. artist dialogue necessary? And obviously, you found a place to have dialogue with artists. You founded well, a place. Well, I think, I think artist dialogue is very necessary because art as an idiom and as idioms um, is one of the most unique modes of communication. And I think very necessary. All of us have a need to express. Mm -hmm. And I never uh, uh, separated um, idioms and disciplines in the arts. Um, so you I think you that I'm fortunate that my friends are dancers and writers and musicians and so actors So were they and part of this community that you were uh, oh, founding? Yes. Oh, yes. All different yes. types yes. of yes. artists. All different types of artists. We did not have a place to together um. and develop. And the idea of uh, facilities at that time, such as the Intercity Cultural Center, mm -hmm. uh, Jack uh, Bernard, Bernard Jackson, rather, was one of uh, the, the, the really energetic cultural leaders in the city of Los Angeles. And uh, I learned a lot by knowing him and working with him. Uh, but at uh, the Watts Towers Art Center and the Communicative Arts Academy before that, I, see. I got good exercise as an artist in um, working in a very close way with people in the community I and ideas that came to the facility from people in the community. I, I think that part of it is so necessary and I see right now where young artists, fine artists, are mm -hmm. in such competition with each other that they don't have that dialogue. <sighs> uh, I see what you're talking about though, going out into the different fields of the arts. Well, we had to do that. Uh, there were no provisions and no accommodations for us. We had to create those accommodations. D during the 60s, there were not galleries that were very accommodating uh, to people like myself. But look and at this uh, art on the set. I mean, it's absolutely... Well, you, you do what you do simply you know, because powerful. it is who you are. Well, it is that's who you what are. It, oh, so that's what... Um, you know. <clears throat> if, there, if there's never a place, there's going to be a place inside of you for the growth and development of your feeling. But that's and, a true and, artist speaking. Yeah. A true artist makes art because he has to make art, right? It's, it's, like, wo it's like being wounded with a blessing. <laughs> you know? <laughs> that's Even all, if you I don't mean, have a place to show it, right? Exactly, exactly. I mean, you do what you have to do. And uh, I think my musician friends are, are that way. Whether you're making the money or not. Same thing, you isn't gotta it? You've got to make the music. You know? That's right. Or otherwise, um, when they get, do make the money, they mm -hmm. haven't been making the music and it, they're not there. Precisely. And then I never, I never equated money making with art making. Uh huh. I'll do anything that I have to do to feed my family. But I never believed in burlesque the sensibility of uh, my vision. Did that? I'm very fortunate when I get responses, you know. Did, did being at the Watts Tower for so long hamper your art in any way? I think your it enhanced my, my art oh. because it it carried with it um, those avenues of opportunity that come to you from the people that that assist you mm -hmm. in knowing how important the arts and culture are to communities. But you had an and open mind to that, I guess. Yeah, I, I looked <laughs> at what I did administratively as, as another aspect of my discipline as an artist. Because administration could be pretty boring. But there's <laughs> no point in me saying to, to major institutions or um, uh, the greater community that I don't have a place to think. Mm -hmm. I don't have a place to feel uh, when I have uh, 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 the potential 
together the kind of resources that we have in our community, mm -hmm. like the talent of a mm -hmm. community, mm -hmm. and, and, and to formulate the Watchtowers Art Center was donated to the city of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. The Watchtowers were donated to the city of Los Angeles. And I think it, it, it's very important for people to know that the building, the Watchtowers, the cultural center mm -hmm. was actually created by the people of the community and, you were and there, donated to. But you were there creating that center at Well, that I, time. I had a lot to do with developing programming, but the, the, the group of citizens that were really responsible for the development of the Art Center uh, was the committee for the Simon Rodia Towers in Watts. I see. That was the group that came together to oppose the city's position years ago when I the city see. wanted to bring down the, uh, bring the, down the structure. I, I don't, yeah. don't want to take all of our be, time. It gets to be very complicated. Yeah, I don't want you know. to because I think it's a wonderful thing. And I <laughs> thought it was great that you were in there. I want you to tell us a little bit about the sculpture on the set because we don't have too much time left. Oh, that piece? Um, what, what you call that it? That particular piece uh, grows out of a doll series that I did that was <coughs> actually stimulated or inspired by my daughter's interest in dolls. Uh. And uh, I ended up doing about 37 pieces. That's an early piece, which I call uh, Deja Voodoo. Did you construct the whole thing? Yes, And yes. all out of found it has objects? Human, it has human hair. Mm. And we're looking at canvas, stitched canvas, and old, old rag stuff, mm. wood, and a faded piece of flag stuff. And the right. piece next to you is quite different. It has quite more different. of an African overtone. Well, I, I would 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 think that it, what? it it reminds it could remind you of a mask. Of a mask, of, yeah, of, that's of some sort. That's a recent piece. Just oh. a small piece. Also found objects. Not not altogether. Found objects in part, but there's some hand rubbed and hand formed pieces there as well, plus human hair, uh -huh. and. Uh, but this is part of an old grain shovel. That's what I was wondering if that uh -huh. was part of the found uh, yeah. pieces. Yes. Do that you work is, on canvas? I work on canvas as well. Uh, what, what do you prefer? What uh, medium? Thought. Thought. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> so as long as you're thinking it can go as into long as it, As long as I can harness um, or give credibility to the invisible, mm. something that did not quite exist before I created it, you well, know, you, know and, uh, you, that did, you did that <laughs> for us today. You gave us, you <laughs> gave us thought. We're, we're finished. Our time is up. Is that right? Yeah, it's ah. already over, but you've been, you have given us something to think about, and I thank you so much for coming on today, Well, John I thank Outerbridge. you very much for and, inviting me. And thank you for having this. Thanks also to all of you for watching today. And uh, we'll see you next time. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, and we'll answer all of your questions.